and on the uh, now we can uh, compute uh, the overall uh, probability of X, so the probability of observing a combination of features irrespective of what class was the correct one. So uh, it, it's basically uh, this plus that gives that. This is the denominator. And now we can plug all of this in uh, to compute the posterior probabilities. So here you have color coded the posterior probability of uh, having or of an unknown sample uh, to belong to the red class uh, or in this case uh, to belong to the blue class as a function of the features that you have measured. Okay, so uh, we plugged in the prior probability of each of the classes and we plugged in these class densities that in reality we need to somehow estimate from uh, training data and uh, given all of that we uh, come up with a way of uh, estimating at any point in feature space the probability of a sample belonging to the one class or to the other class and since the classes overlap you can see that uh, this is not a step function so it does not go from zero to one immediately but uh, we have some uh, compromise area here where the posterior probability would be one half so where the, we cannot really decide if a sample belongs to the one class or to the other class so uh, in a classification uh, if we try and uh, approximate or learn all the terms on the right hand side and then plug these into Bayes' theorem. This is called a generative classifier, whereas if we directly try to learn this function from the training data, and this is called a discriminative classifier. So, um, now we can finally look at what is the best conceivable classifier ever. Okay, this is the subject of uh, statistical decision theory. It used to also be called statistical learning theory, uh, but since that time uh, there was an influential book written by Vapnik and somehow the meaning in the field has changed, so let me now call this statistical decision theory. Um, if there is something like uh, a Schrodinger equation of uh, learning, I would say it's this. So it is really uh, uh, one of the most fundamental equations uh, in the field and uh, it answers uh, the following questions namely uh, what does the best possible classifier look like And also, uh, best doesn't mean uh, perfect, so uh, uh, how good is it? And the answers to these questions, uh, they are called the base classifier and the base risk. And we will now look at uh, how to arrive at these answers. Uh, first of all, uh, we need to define a loss function. Um, so the loss function, so all of these are technical terms, which uh, you should know. Um, the loss function has two arguments. On the one hand, uh, a true class and a predicted class. And uh, 
it tells us uh, how bad it is if you make uh, one kind or the other kind of uh, mistake. Um, so this is a a real-life question. Uh, so for instance, if you want to develop uh, a test to see if somebody is uh, HIV positive, um, sometimes there are borderline cases and uh, given the measurements and you still need to make a decision and then you have to think about. Um, so let's say the person was not HIV positive but I told that person so. Um, you know, you might uh, create havoc uh, in that poor guy's life. Um, or on, on the other hand, what happens if somebody was positive but you did not tell them so, uh, and you know more people might get infected and so on. So uh, um, there's a trade-off that the user has to adjust. So the loss function is not something that you can learn from uh, the training data. This is really a user decision. How bad is it to make one kind of mistake or the other? And unfortunately. Uh, in most cases, uh, uh, there will be mistakes. So, uh, if, if you think of it, there are it is rare in, in life to, uh, you know, have encounter situations where you can make decisions with a zero percent error rate. So, uh, these loss functions are uh, often uh, summarized in a, in a table. So. Uh, we have a loss, and then we have, uh, for, for example, a predicted class and a true class. And uh, let's say, you know, we can call these classes, it doesn't really matter, but uh, let's call these classes 1 and 2 and the predicted classes are called 1 and 2 and now the the loss if the true class is 1 and if we predict class 1 uh, in a popular loss function or in most loss functions it makes sense to set these costs to 0 and similarly if, if the true class is 2 and you predict class 2 then uh, the loss uh, also makes sense uh, to be set to 0 um, but now these other costs uh, they can be asymmetric uh, but if you want to keep things simple, you can just put uh, a 1 here and then this particular matrix here would be called uh, the 0, 1 loss. So 0 loss if a decision is correct and a constant penalty uh, if you made an error. Now. We can uh, look at the risk R of a classifier F and the risk it also depends of course on the pro on the problem that you're looking at. So I should really put somewhere uh, indices x and y to say that this also depends on uh, the distribution of your random variables. Uh, but, you know, to keep things simple, I'm, uh, I'm omitting this here. And this is defined as uh, an expectation with respect to the features, an expectation with respect to the labels, of the loss function given my current classifier. So, uh, importantly, we now treat both the features and the labels as a random variable. Now, this is just a model. So, uh, we have patients, and the patients are not random, and uh, if they're healthy or not, this is also not random. But we now make an abstraction and uh, treat uh, all of those as uh, random processes uh, that obey uh, some uh, underlying <laughs> distribution. Um, so, these are the features, and uh, these features are random classifier itself uh, in most cases should be deterministic so 
you see for some given set of features the classifier should always say uh, the patient is healthy or the patient is sick. It doesn't make sense for the classifier for the same input, input values to sometimes say the one and sometimes say the other. So this reminds me of my English teacher. Um, he, uh, uh, he said, uh, if you're not sure about the spelling of the word, he, has, uh, he had some students in class that tried out all the spellings uh, so that you know, they, would have, they would have it right once. But uh, you're not, you know, you, you're not uh, rewarded for getting it right, you're penalized for getting it wrong. And if you try out all the different spellings, then you're certain to get it wrong at least once. So uh, that's why the classifier here should be deterministic. Uh, it should settle on one given prediction for a given set of features and either that will be correct and all is fine or it will be wrong and that's unfortunate. Okay, um, but the label itself is also a random variable so we treat this also uh, uh, as a random element. Okay, um, and now I'm assuming that uh, feature space is continuous, that's arbitrary, sometimes feature space is discrete, but here I'm assuming that it's continuous, and uh, I assume that we have uh, categorical labels. So this will be a continuous and this will be a discrete random variable. Um, for a continuous uh, feature space, just using uh, the definition of the expectation that we've seen before. Um, this can be written as an integral over all of uh, feature space um, of So this is just a definition of uh, the expectation with respect to x. And if we want to, so we want to find the best possible classifier that will minimize this risk. If we want to minimize the overall risk, uh, it makes sense to minimize it at each point in feature space. So we can in the following just uh, concentrate on this part here, the kernel of the integral. So the kernel of the integral can be rewritten as follows. We have a summation over all possible labels from, uh, I use this uh, script, capital script Y, to indicate uh, the alphabet or the set of all possible labels uh, that we can have. Um, the loss function this is an indicator function, so it's 1 if its argument is true and 0 otherwise. And we have the conditional probability um, because we have already fixed the position x. We're now looking at just one point in feature space. So the first summation uh, goes over the true labels that we could potentially have at this point in feature space. And the second summation goes over the predictions z that the classifier could make. Because at this point, we have not decided what prediction the classifier will make. And if we now use this 0, 1 loss, um, this becomes simpler. 
for the zero one loss, we just need to take the two cases into account. Uh, either we make uh, the correct prediction, so either our classifier predicted z uh, and then our loss is zero and uh, this term disappears or we made the wrong prediction and we incur a loss of one. So uh, taken together what we get is because there is uh, one single case, uh, namely f of x coinciding with y, in which we have no loss, and in all other cases we get this loss of 1. And if you now remember the summation property, so if we summed over all possible y's, uh, this being a conditional, we would get out 1. However, there is one element missing, so this is the same as 1 minus the posterior of the predicted class. So um, the best classifier which is uh, synonymous for the base classifier <coughs> is given by, remember we want to make the risk as small as possible. So to make the risk as small as possible we have to make this expectation as small as possible. Uh, hence we have to make this term with a negative sign as large as possible. So I, I'm writing FB here for the base classifier. And this should simply be the class which has uh, the largest posterior at this location X. Okay, so uh, this is a great result. Um, we now, it's nice because uh, we can show theoretically that this is the best possible classifier and it's also nice because we can understand it intuitively. Um, so P of Z given X uh, tells us how likely is the posterior probability of a given class at a given point in feature space and the best classifier is the one that predicts the dominant class. So uh, it's a rule that also makes sense intuitively. Now the way that it has been written here um, that was only for the zero one loss. If we use asymmetric loss functions uh, then the formula becomes a little bit more complicated uh, and it boils down to us preferring uh, not the dominant class, but each class is weighted uh, by its loss and uh, an appropriate class is uh, selected. And there is uh, another generalization which is important, namely uh, you can uh, uh, extend this table uh, of the loss function to uh, allow your classifier not only to predict class 1 or class 2, but you may also permit your classifier uh, to predict or to, to just say it doesn't know. I've written doubt here. So the classifier announces doubt and uh, there's typically uh, a fixed uh, cost D associated with this. And uh, so if you now carry this through the calculations, you will find that uh, the classifier uh, predicts the locally dominant class provided that it is sufficiently strong. Uh, 
if none of the classes uh, really is dominant at, a, at that point in feature space, it might be cheaper for the classifier to just <laughs> announce doubt. Uh, another caveat that we will uh, return to later in the semester is that uh, even with this extension, even with having a doubt in there, uh, does not guard your classifier against totally outlying samples. So if you now make a measurement, uh, let's say out here, uh, a patient has these values which have never before been observed. Um, well, if you dumbly follow your classifier, well, you would say, okay, it's somewhere on the red side. So I'm going to predict the red class. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you if you had a million patients in here, and then suddenly there's one out there, uh, it sh it should make you think. So uh, uh, this is the subject of outlier rejection, and it's not addressed by even this extension of the loss function. So, um, in words. Uh, the, base uh, the base classifier is given by uh, the prediction of the locally dominant class. So now come the buts. <laughs> this has all been great. But uh, on the one hand, uh, best does not mean perfect. And minimizing the risk does not mean that the risk is zero. And uh, a measure of uh, the risk is uh, given by, well, by computing this risk function here. So by again uh, integrating uh, these expected losses uh, over all of space weighted with the probabilities of observing samples there. Uh, this is uh, best illustrated, uh, so this is measured by the Bayes risk. So the Bayes risk tells you how good can your classifier possibly be, even under ideal circumstances. Uh, it's most conveniently uh, uh, shown in one dimension. So let's say this is x, and I'm showing here um, the probability of, let's say, x given class 1, and the probability of x given class 2. And uh, you will put your uh, threshold somewhere, uh, depending on what loss function you picked. And uh, let's assume that I'm putting my decision uh, threshold there. So the amount of uh, error I'm going to make uh, is uh, the integral of the uh, Now the, the integral of the one class, of, of the weaker class uh, beyond uh, the threshold. And uh, well, this threshold is optimally adjusted depending on the priors and depending on uh, your, uh, uh, your loss function. Because the, the prior, you know, through Bayes' theorem ends up uh, or has its impact on the posterior. So in, in plain words, uh, if your classes have a lot of overlap in feature space, uh, you're not going to get good classification results. Uh, so if classes have much overlap in feature space, Classification will be error prone. And in that case, you should uh, scratch your head and think if you cannot find more informative features. <laughs>
because this overlap in feature space is not a property of the classifier, it's a property of the features you selected. So if you're not happy with the amount of overlap you have, better think if you, if you can find uh, new features. Now, the second but is that uh, all of this you know, nice base classifier and so on, uh, it unfortunately depends on knowledge of the true class densities. So I always had this I innocently wrote this P here, pretending that we know the true class density, but we don't. So uh, the, the formula that we've seen, especially the formula for the base classifier, um, they require the true posterior or the true class densities depending on whether you have a generative or discriminative uh, classifier. But unfortunately, these are not known. Instead, they need to be estimated painfully from your training data. So let me show you pictures. Yeah, here is uh, an example from this uh, script that I mentioned. And uh, so, as a super user, I uh, created uh, this ground truth for different classes. So uh, uh, I, I played uh, being divine and knowing you know, what the true densities are. And uh, I also sampled training sets from these densities. Uh, so here we have two training sets. Uh, drawn from these densities and uh, shown in green is the base classifier. So in this case I assume the zero one loss function so the base classifier is given by uh, or the, the decision boundary of the base classifier is that set of points where the posterior is one half. So here we have the class density of the one class, of the other class. This is the posterior. And now the set of points where the posterior probability has a value of one half was here indicated by a green line. So this is the decision boundary of the base classifier. And inside it would predict blue class. And outside it would predict the red class. And uh, estimating this decision boundary from the training data, this is what we then try to do in everyday practice. However, down here you see two examples of training data, and I think this is of the order of uh, 100 or so, uh, 200 points, which is quite a lot for just two-dimensional data. And you see that uh, estimating the green function, which I hope you can still see, estimating the green function from these scattered points here is quite difficult. Uh, especially, you know, this, uh, you see this small blob here, this annex, uh, this annex is not at all supported by this training set, for example. So in the first training set, okay, I have a blue point in the area of the annex and red ones outside. But in this plot, uh, it just so happened through the random sampling process that I don't even observe any blue samples in here. But still, the best possible classifier would have the annex here. So um, to go from here to the decision boundaries or to go from here to a good estimate, uh, that is really, you know, difficult. That's uh, part of the art and science uh, of uh, pattern recognition. Um, okay, having said that, uh, you can now argue with me why maybe this blob is not so important. Can you give a reason? Classifier on data that, that I've drawn from this distribution, and I might have overfitted just because I've drawn some data and not, I don't have the true 
so uh, uh, the answer was uh, we might have overfitting um, but you see the green line is not at all overfitted. The green line in this case the, is the base classifier so it was not derived from the training data but it was derived from the true but unknown densities. So having these blobs is not overfitting. They should really be there in the super perfect classifier. Maybe not having this annex is not uh, it's only a small problem because its area is quite small and if you see it correctly it has uh, quite low values compared to the rest of the classifier so the error we are going to make if we miss it is small in comparison to the rest. That's correct. So if we, if we look again at the formula um, there was a weighing, yeah, oh sorry it's already there. Um, so if we look at the formula for the risk, there was a weighing with the local probability in the feature space. And uh, it so happens that uh, if I add these two class densities, uh, there's not so much data in the area of this annex. Remember that this is just a posterior probability. This tells me nothing about the amount of uh, data that I'm going to expect. So the annex is lying somewhere here and you see that we don't have so much probability there. Or in other words, we don't have so many blue and red symbols in the area of this NX. And that is indeed why it is not so important. Uh, so it, it could also be, you know, that the base classifier still has a green island somewhere out there, but that also would not matter much because it's too remote from where the bulk of the data really lies. Yeah. So uh, this weighing with the density is also uh, an important factor. So we want the classifier to be good in those regions where we really expect a lot of data. Okay, do you have more questions? So I think we have uh, covered some ground today. Uh, I showed you K nearest neighbor classification uh, and that I think is a real take home message. So for those uh, who do not want to uh, come back, uh, if you just remember K nearest neighbors, that's already, you know, you've learned something for life. Um, for all those um, who want to uh, know why we will spend the rest of the semester talking about many different classifiers be besides k nearest neighbors. Um, what we have now looked at last uh, is an important tool um, because it lets us understand um, the importance of uh, getting the posteriors right and we will see in the course of the semester how well just how difficult that sometimes is and uh, in particular how difficult that is if we don't have 200 points in two dimensions but if we have 50 points uh, in a thousand dimensions and uh, this is unfortunately uh, often the case and uh, you know you can very well ask uh, if you're doing the experiments yourself then you will understand perfectly uh, well why you have just 50 points because you don't want to spend another year in the lab getting another 50 points uh, if you're working with collaborators then they will be the ones who tell you uh, that no that's all you get and now uh, make the best of it um, so in this uh, last part we have seen uh, the concept of a risk and uh, what the best possible minimizer is the base classifier and we've seen why unfortunately it is not practicable. Okay, so that's it for today and that lets us come to the organizational stuff, uh, namely